It's time, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Save by Nature Birch Photo Walks. We have here Edward Rooks and his lovely wife, Janice Edgerly Rooks. And uh, again, you know, if you recognize uh, Edward, it's because Edward's done some programs. He's a nature uh, artist, and you've probably done some. Remember last week we did watercolors and stuff, right? And so uh, little do you know, though, it's a family affair. Nature is a great thing, you know, and so they're here. We're going to be learning today. Janice being a biologist, learning about colors and things and what those mean. This is the perfect place to do it, being a, a plant museum. OK, so I'm going to have them just quickly introduce themselves and then we'll get the program uh, started. Yes, I'm a professor at Santa Clara University and I study insect behavior and evolution. I have an entomology degree from Cornell University and Met Edward in the rainforest in Trinidad, where I did my PhD work. What was Edward doing in the rainforest? <laughs> did you find him in a tree? I was born in the rainforest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get started. Well, one of the things that I noticed about standing here is that there's grasses everywhere. And so as an evolutionary biologist, I like to think about the transition from what you see with the grasses is wind pollination. A lot of people have trouble with that because we're allergic to pollen and that's the way plants evolved to spread was in pollen and it would blow on the wind and they would release you know millions and millions of pollen grains each one carrying sperm uh, in hopes of finding a female right so we still we still see wind pollination um conifers and we actually have a picture of a tree that's here Edward, can you show yeah. the um the tassel Oh, you're gonna show that. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we're gonna see one oh, of these cool. as we walk. We've actually found okay. one tucked in on one of the trails. Let me the get trails. a little. So, uh, so yeah, tell us a little about it. I've seen one of these at Castle Rock for the first time ever. Silk tassel. Silk tassel. Yeah, and so you can see the the architecture of this is that it hangs down, and typically what you find is if the plant is relying on wind, they're designed for that purpose and spread millions and millions of pollen grains. Then what happened in evolutionary time is the insects started to interact with the plants and that's what we're going to talk about today is how they went from using wind, which some plants still do, uh, to communicating with insects. And so I look at it as an interaction, a communication between flowers and insects. We often use the word mutualism to describe that interaction. It started with beetles, we think, where they would come and they would actually would eat the pollen, so it was more of a predatory prey interaction. But then the plants gain an advantage because the beetles would be somewhat loyal flowers and they would go from one flower to the next spreading the pollen. So even though the plant was sacrificing pollen, which the wind pollinators do as well, yeah. the plants that were relying on the insects gained a tremendous advantage. And so it kind of teeters a fine line between mutualism where the plant gets an advantage and the insect gets an advantage and predation because the insects actually are eating the pollen. So we're going to look and see how flowers are communicating with these insects, which now, of course, most people think about bees. Yeah. But if you look at flowers, you're going to see true bugs, beetles, all kinds of insects, flies. They don't get a lot of credit, but they are pollinators as well. Yeah. Um, now, the mutualism comes with the plant now giving a reward to these insects, right? Mm -hmm. So they're eating the pollen, but the plants started to engage more and more and more with these insects, and they started to provide rewards. Uh, and that mostly we think about nectar, right? Yeah. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go look at a classic plant over here. See checkered beetles. They're eating the pollen, but you'll see checkered beetles have hair all over them. Uh -huh. So the pollen gets stuck in as they go from one flower to the next of the same species. That's really important for the plant. Mm -hmm. Uh, then pollination occurs. But really what happened though is these other insects have become dedicated to that. So it's much more common to see the famous bees and you know hoverflies and bee flies are actually more more likely to be using the flowers. And also hummingbirds, we don't want to forget hummingbirds. So we'll look at and see like what I call different syndromes. Mm -hmm. Which insects are the plants communicating with? We can look at the color and the shape. And as you were saying before, the fact that there's a platform for them to land. Uh, so if you see a flower like the rose, you see the pollen is sitting up on, up around the center. Mm -hmm. The reward is in the center. The insect lands and gets the pollen on them. And they can actually land and walk around. So this is more typical of an insect pollinated plant. Okay. 
um, cause you know, they have to land. What's that right there? Yeah, bumblebees love this. So, you know, you have to think about it. it's a bit of a cost benefit relationship, isn't it? Where the plant has to produce lots of pollen because the insects are collecting it. Um, and then they give them the reward, but then they get it all in their hairs and then they go to the next one. It's really fun. And they're right next to each other. And that's the thing you were saying. This is like a botanical garden where you just have all these wild plants right next to each other. Okay, here I come. Bumblebee, so you can see her. She's gorgeous. So she's a worker. She's a worker. And that's the other thing that's important to recognize is the bees have all sorts of structures. We even have a picture of that I'll show you in a minute, where her legs are designed for her to carry pollen. So you'll see the bees with these big loads of pollen as they go around. So they're not only getting a nectar reward, here she is now, is she's collecting pollen to take back to her colony, right? I mean, so it's really become this mutualistic interaction, an entire, as I call a syndrome, that this, this insect is devoted to pollen and nectar, and the flower is devoted to the bees, right? Now, one of the things about this is you'll see that she goes from one rose flower to the next. That's very important from the plant's point of view. But also from the bee's point of view, there's this book called The Bumblebee Economics. Have you heard about that? It's a fantastic book by Heinrich where he realized that there's, the bee is really under tremendous selective pressure to do it right. And so they will go and they'll, they'll find a place of hatch and they'll stay in it as long as it's giving them a reward because they have a very high metabolic rate to be able to fly like they do and to take care of their colony. And so they'll have what we call flower constancy. They learn, this is where I wanna go, and you'll see them go from one to the next. And they're not like flying around looking for different flowers. They learn how to handle this flower and that's in the benefit of the bee, which is under constraints and the benefit of the flower. This is classic mutualism, I would say, right? He agrees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we're going to look at this one spot over here that just has tremendous variability. Wow. Yeah, this is why I'm getting into the ninja walk right, right here. I just want to show them this. So oh, there's another bee. Yeah, so we're going to spend a lot of time here. Oh, good, good. Did you want to talk about this right here or yes, that? I okay, do. okay, good. So um, I have a picture to show you. Okay. So these are columbines, which are, you know, popular all over uh, California, very common. And you see the different shapes. So a colleague of mine, Justin Whittall, did a, a really fantastic research project on this where he found, this is what I'd call a syndrome. This is a hummingbird flower. See how it hangs down and it has this really long tube. The animal needs a really long tongue. I'm gonna to show you some pictures of tongues. <laughs> this is an insect columbine. So that it has a place for it to land and the colors are purple and white. And we're gonna talk about color in a minute. This one's red and you know, the hummingbirds are famous for wanting red, right? For, for locating flowers that are red. And you were just showing that one on the ground here, the hummingbird stage. Let's see. So it has that long tube, it has that red color. So it's even called a hummingbird sage. Now that doesn't mean other, other animals aren't gonna try it. We've seen like some really big bees will land on the back of that and cut a hole right in the back to steal the nectar. But this is a classic hummingbird flower. And you see how the pollen would touch them? Mm -hmm. I just um, stuck in my finger. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and hummingbirds, you know, they learn how to use different flowers and they'll keep coming back and this plant will give out nectar a certain time of day and train the hummingbird to come back and go from one hummingbird stage to the next. In the meantime, the bumblebees are going and there's some bumblebees here that have learned that the poppies are the great resource and they go from one poppy to the next and we just had a bunch of them here. Yeah, they're, they're over there. The they're top. over there and so just like with the rose, 
these hum these bumblebees were going from one to the next to the next to the next. And as I said, that's in the best interest of both of these interactors. The, one bee, behind you is the bee is able to awesome. minimize the energy it's using and the flower is, you know, getting customer loyalty, they call it. Somebody asked about how the color influences the bees. What we want to look at here are two things. Um, so I have a picture here I wanted to show you. The idea of the tongue. This is the tongue of the hummingbird. Look, it comes, it wraps around. tongue. Here's the tongue of the bumblebee, and you see how it can collect pollen and put it on its hind leg and take it home to the colony. And then you see a bee fly. Hopefully you can just see that little spear. Everybody has a different tongue. Let me turn the page here. So here's the, um, one of the hawk moths. Very long tongue, and you see you can use this larkspur flower. We get, start to see these matches. Here's a long, long, long tongue of this uh, spingid, this hawk moth. And you see the color white, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. So we get the length of the flower. And so, you know, the flower really depends on this constancy. You can't have just everybody coming. It needs to be dedicated pollinator from the flower's point of view. But the energy constraints on the animal also dictates that the animal agrees with that, uh, with that contract. Color is the other thing that we want to talk about. And it's such a great question. And, you know, people love color. So like we, we were at Filoli last year and you just see how people are just pushing color when they breed plants and they're taking advantage of something that we, that we understand, you know, what, what's going on between the insect and the hummingbird and the flowers pushes these colors because that's how they're communicating, right? All right, so this is um, how our, our color vision works with our cones. So this is the wavelength of light here. So when you see a peak like this, this is a human eye. This is the peak perception that we have in the purples and blues. We also have green and tend towards red. So we can see, you know, red, green, purple, blue. Here's the bee. They also have trichromatic vision, but you can see the peak of their vision is a little bit skewed from us. They actually, some of the bees can see some things called bee white. We actually had to give it different names because we don't even see the thing. But if you look here, this is UV. Now we notice the hummingbird has four cones, which is really cool. And they will see UV. So they see what we see reds, yellows, greens, blues, and UV, but look at their UV perception is skewed a little bit to the okay. right here. The bee can see much more for, further into the UV, and so that's another thing about color, is there's a lot of color here, and you know about that, you were talking about that earlier, is that the, the bees can see UV and we don't see it, and the flowers actually have that, have they have those markings on them. And so um, there's a plant over here that I wanted to talk about that has tremendous UV color on it in some places in uh, North America. So here we see the regular flower that we would see and then you put a UV filter and it brightens up a different pattern. Now that's not exactly what the bee sees, but it's the pattern that they see and it's going to be some purplish color that we can't see, but that's the pattern and look how it marks. It's a bullseye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the thing is, I was saying, like there's this contract that the bee really has to minimize the energy it uses to get its food. And so the flower is making it easy. And the bees learn this. So here's what we see. And then here's where the color marking is in UV. And what happens also is that it's very bright on the edge. And I was reading an experimental paper where they found that that brightness contrasts with the grasses in the background. So you get like this bright purple shine against the green grass and the insects really see it and they go right to it. So we're going to talk about the monkey flowers, which we have a fantastic patch over here. Um, they get, come in all these different colors. What we have here is more of a yellow orange. And I read this fantastic study that was uh, up in Canada where they had the bumblebees. Here's the visible light and you see the pattern. They have it only in black and white in the, in the, um, publication. But there's a pattern where you get bright and dark that we're not seeing. It's all in UV. Here's another picture if you colorize it in purple. This is all UV on monkey flower where we see it look like that, right? Mm. So let's go look at the monkey flowers.
Yes, that's a great specimen. It's gorgeous. So the interesting thing in that study in Canada, this one's a little more orange. The one in Canada, they had all this variation all the way to yellow. The yellow had so much UV on it, and they found that the hummingbirds n did not go to those flowers. It was the bumblebees that went to those flowers. And then the red ones, the hummingbirds went to the red ones. So that's what I was saying, you know, you get these flowers that are communicating with different animals. And even in one, one um, group, the monkey flowers, you see that variation, just like in the columbines, as I was mentioning. So yesterday when we were here, who went to the monkey flowers? Oh, look, there's a bee. Inside? Yeah, there's a bee, yeah. So I would say, you know, the hummingbirds might try it and they might learn it's okay, because, you know, these pollinators are smart. So they'll try it. But the thing is, they found that the, uh, the hummingbirds weren't going to the yellow ones at all. Yesterday was really nice to see the native bees were using this, the little tiny native bees, but there's a bumblebee. And she climbs, has to climb all the way in, and you'll mm -hmm. see, you know, she's gonna end up, oh no, see, so there's a hemipteran in here. You know, so other insects are going to go in and they're going to take advantage of this resource. So here it is, a conspicuous resource. The plant has that problem, right? <laughs> oh, you can see the bumblebee? Yeah. Going into the yeah, no, she, what you would expect is that she would try yes, one after, you know what? I think they can also smell if there's a nectar reward. You ever notice that they fly and like refuse to go into certain ones and then they find the key one? So I think that they can tell and the, for the plant also, if it has its pollen, it really should send out some sort of signal. This is the one you want. So this is a great spot. Cause you know, you have these funny little flowers here. Did you notice that? Oh, there's a coffee? Oh, so there's a bee. This is a coffee berry and it's just so inconspicuous, but it's dripping with, with uh, nectar. Mm. And the insects love it. Oh, is that what the shiny stuff is on the leaf? Yeah, you can see you oh, yeah. the flowers are just glistening with nectar. So it's not the classic, oh, wow, look at that gorgeous flower kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the insects just love this, and the reward is high. They go from one flower to the next, dripping with, with nectar. I can just see them glistening. And some days you come and you'll see coffee berries just covered with all kinds of insects using this resource. So really neat. Cool. This is full. It's a nice spot, huh? The other way that uh, plants talk to insects, and you know this, is that they smell fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. Why do Why do roses smell so sweet? Now we have Mother's Day coming up, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to thank the insects for that one mm -hmm. because the birds, the birds are not using their sense of smell to find these flowers but the insects are. And so the sweet smell, the beautiful flowers, you know, people, some people don't like insects, but we need to thank the insects uh, for, and I call it beauty, right? Because we appreciate that same thing, you know, the shapes, the colors, the contrast, humans appreciate that same, same thing. But the scent, typically, you know, jasmine's been in bloom in the spring. It smells so sweet, like in our backyard, wow. Um, they're talking to moths. Now, bats might also be involved in some of this, right? But when you have the jasmine all of a sudden in the evening, wow, there's that smell. They're talking to the insects. The insects have their antennae. So I'm not smelling any here, but, so I just want to mention, you can't smell it on the, um, the video either, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna walk. Oh, do you know um, flies are pollinators too? Have you heard about how Sometimes if there's a plant pollinated by flies that have like these dark red marks and they smell like rotten flesh. So mm. that's another set. Maybe you don't thank insects for that. But. Oh, I've heard of that one, <laughs> yeah. the rotten flesh one. This flower is fantastic. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Um, thing that we call the markings, we call them nectar guides. Remember I mentioned it looks like a bullseye? This is classic, this mallow. And the insects learn. Now I had my students do a, an experiment where we made some fake flowers and trained some bees, some honeybees to come. And we had these little purple arrows pointing to the middle and the bees learned to follow those arrows. And like the next day we turned the arrows out 
the bees followed the arrows right out. So wow. they really were using the marks. As I said, that constraint of having to minimize energy, they learn and the plants are taking advantage that these insects learn how to use the flowers. Um, so yeah, it's really beautiful. Huh? This is a mallow. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about when we go on this trail, it brings up another thing about the interaction between insects and plants. This is, this is a cherry flower. Can mm. you see that? All right. I'm going to take a cherry. That's yeah, good. I was just talking about the scent where we have chemicals coming off roses. Here we are, chemistry class now, mm. right? Um, this is the other way we look at plants, the herb station, I call it. <laughs> so the other interaction you'll find between plants and insects and other animals is, you know, here the insects, the plant is advertising itself with the flower, right? It has to get the pollen out, but it also doesn't want its leaves eaten. And we take advantage of these compounds with herbs for our pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera. Here's tea, right? It's from leaves. So why do they have these compounds? Caffeine, so we have tea and caffeine. These are from plants. Why do plants have these chemicals? Here's the cherry. We just saw this gorgeous cherry flower. Look at the size of the bee on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so again, it's just dripping. Oh gosh, it's gorgeous, huh? It's beautiful native bee. Yeah, native bee. But the leaves, I just picked one. Mm -hmm. If I cut this open, I can smell it. I don't have my mask on. It's cyanide. Oh. So, yeah, so the plants have all sorts of chemicals that are not for photosynthesis or metabolism, but for protection and also those scents, the colors, all these things are because of the interactions with animals. And sometimes it's the, you know, come here to my flower, but don't eat my leaves, mm -hmm. right? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. It's very, oh cool. my gosh, they're called secondary plant compounds because they're secondary to the life of the plant in yeah. terms of photosynthesis. Plants are just tanked up on poisons, but you'll see the interaction over time, over evolutionary time, a lot of insects are able to come up with bio biochemical machinery to handle it. So this cherry would, for example, in some parts of the country, they're eaten by tent caterpillars and, you know, cause they can handle the cyanide. It's amazing, huh? Here we got the silk tassel. Nice. So that's that different architecture I was telling you about. The flowers are a little past. Yeah, they're past. Pull the branch down a little bit. You know, I tend, they tend to be springtime because they don't want to compete with all the other leaves and stuff. So, boing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's really cool. Like the tassel of a graduation tassel. Yeah, oh, yeah, this, you know, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Oh, that's got it. Yeah, silk tassel. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, look at this oh, one. Okay. Yeah, that's this. helps. Look at this, guys. This wow. is a very common plant out here. Mm -hmm. um, it's also chemically protected leaves. They smell fantastic. Isn't this the plant ever? The sage, yeah. yeah. I think it's flat sage. I'm not, no, I'm not sure which one this is. It's probably a sign. Yeah. It's huge. It, it's definitely chemically protected though, the leaves. Those oils, it smells fantastic. <laughs> I love these flowers. They have purple flowers. Purple is a, just a perfect color for, for insect pollination. And you can see the stamens sticking right out. The insect has to fight its way past that to get the nectar reward. Just a perfect example of an insect flower, insect pollinated yeah, flower. Right, yeah. But I wouldn't put it past a hummingbird trying it, you know. I mean, they do try to figure out what's in their habitat. Most people don't realize that the honeybee is not native. She'll go back and tell her sisters. Look at her. She's collecting pollen too. She gets pollen all over her. Come here, sweetie. That's spots. <laughs> Let's see some ladybird beetles up here. This plant is really common in California. It's an introduced plant. It's a mustard. Um, so like in the spring, when you see the hillsides turn yellow with their flowers, it's often this one, right? 
So I wanted to talk a little bit. Here we have a picture. This is a wild radish we also have here that we'll be able to see on the other side. This butterfly is starting to fly. I've seen them in the yard. This is a European butterfly. So not only do we get the plants, these are European, we get the European butterfly. So it's a cabbage white, and that's the caterpillar, completely camouflaged. I don't even know if you can see it. So like you'll plant bro broccoli, which is related to these plants in your yard, and the next thing you know, you have a caterpillars all over the place, and they're so camouflaged you didn't even know it, right? I wanted to talk about this plant a little bit because people do eat broccoli, radish, horseradish, all that. This is the mustards have what we call a, a mustard oil bomb, <laughs> ready to go. So I have a picture of the chemistry here. Inside the leaves, and I show broccoli because it's related. We can eat this stuff because we're a big animal. We don't, we don't get a lot of the mustard oil that relative to our body size. But the insects that eat this, it could kill them. So they have these two compounds, glucosinolate, and they have myrosinase in their leaves in two different packages. So the enzyme and the substrate are in two different packages in the leaves. And when the insect bites, it brings those two things together and it causes a reaction and releases mustard oil. And it, I, people are having a hard time figuring out why it kills insects, but it's considered an insecticide. Mm -hmm. So why does the caterpillar eat it? Huh? To become poisonous? <laughs> no, that's uh -huh. the thing is insects have a biochemical machinery where lineages of insects have evolved to take advantage of these poisonous plants. You'll see insects eating cherry, which is mm. cyanide. Mm. So the insects evolved a ways of packaging these compounds and they use it against the bird that might try to eat them, right? Um, so there's a whole suite of insects that can eat this mustard. And that's so cool. The plant protects itself by having the, you know, the reagents in separate places. And then when they bite it, the caterpillar bites it, boom, <laughs> they call it a mustard oil bomb. <laughs> so the other thing is that when the, when the it, caterpillars bite that mustard, it lets out the smell of mustard oil. The wasps are like, oh, there must be caterpillars here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the wasps come in. You look, can you look at this? Yeah. So, you know, here at Eulistack, they're, they're advertising these pollinators, the hummingbirds, right? Here's the cabbage white right here. And so since they have mustards on the property, and the monarch butterfly also is one that they're really trying to help here at Eulistack by specifically planting the native milkweed plants. Now milkweed plants are poisonous. They have latex in their veins, which gums up the mandibles of insects, and they have cardiac glycosides, which would stop your heart. So if you were to eat a monarch butterfly, it might very well kill you. That's how much poison this insect is able to take on from that plant. Did you know that? So if you're starving, don't eat a monarch over here. This is a milkweed plant. Look at the insects all over it. You see what the aphids? Aphid? The aphids. Now the thing is, we were here yesterday. You see the, the ladybird beetle? And there's larvae, actually. They... <laughs> so, yeah. I tell you. So you see how the aphids are orange? It's because they're poisonous. So, you know, you get this layer. Now they tap into the phloem, so they're probably not getting a huge wallop of the cardiac glycosides, which are in the leaves. But, and then you get the predators. So the ladybird beetles are here. The, the larvae of the ladybird beetle, I think there's one right here, actually. Is that a larva? See the larva? See the baby ladybird beetle? Oh, yeah. I mean, they just mow these aphids down. <laughs> so like this area right here, you see how it used to have aphids? It doesn't have them anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, there was, there were, um, let me see if I get in there here. There were milkweed. Anything, but I saw That's a good shot, Richard. You got it. Now the aphids, you see how they take over this plant? They go to the most rapid growing part of the plant. You'll know that like if you have roses in your yard, that's where they go, right? Boom. They, they, they become a sink. The foam just goes right towards these aphids. They just pull the foam right in and they reproduce asexually. So the female aphid is just popping out those aphids. Um, and periodically they'll produce winged adults that then go off to another plant. So, so they go back and forth 
between sexual and asexual reproduction. So if they use asexual reproduction, they take over the defenses of this plant very so fast. The, you know what the point was though, that the plants are, you know, they're advertising their flowers, but they also have to protect their leaves, which are the photosynthetic machinery. And so um, we, we get a lot of advantage from these compounds because they do act on fungi, bacteria. They also act on our nervous system, metabolic system. So um, you get these polyphenols from tea, which is actually protecting the plant, but we, we use these compounds. So the stuff we taste is actually what's protecting the plant? Yes. Cool. And the caffeine, that, you know, I mean, why does a plant need caffeine? It doesn't. It uses it to protect itself. It's I thought it was to get the insects all hopped up so they can go yeah. around and... <laughs> yeah. And that's another point. Where do you find, where do you find caffeine is in the coffee bean? What's a, what is a bean or a seed? It's the next generation for the plant. So some of the most poisonous things are seeds. Oh. So, you know, what we eat, we, we can take advantage of certain things, but we have to be very careful. If you just randomly eat seeds. Apple seeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a picture of apple too. But Don't so, so the other one that we talked about was this, the chemical reaction, this, this enzyme and this substrate are in the mustard leaves. And when you bite into them, it releases them. Wow. And you know how when you cook broccoli, you get that sulfur smell and Brussels sprouts? That's the mustard oil, it has sulfur in it. Uh, we can handle it, but the insect, such a tiny little creature, so only a few insects have evolved the ability to handle it biochemically. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a picture from yesterday. Nice. <laughs> and here's the baby. There was an apron in its mouth. Uh, That's a baby ladybug. That was shot so know. that was the last thing I want to talk about, is what is fruit? So coffee berries are actually producing berries now. This is the ovary, the apple, right? What, you know, why do the plants want the animals to come get fruit? That's what fruit is, it's like a flower. It's like, okay, animals, here you go. <laughs> but it has a whole different function. It's like you eat the fruit and then hopefully you poop out the seeds, right? Spit out the seeds. That's where the cyanide is in an apple. And the way that people say don't eat apple seeds, you'd have to break them open to release the cyanide. Uh, so if you chew on them, you're releasing the thing that's protecting the next generation. This is the next generation right here, and this is mommy right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that fruits are like advertising just like flowers, right? They're contrast, they're yellow, they're red, they're like, here! <laughs> I wanted to point out something really nice here. You see that buckeye way in the distance? Yeah. Look at the architecture of that tree. It, that is advertisement. You see the flowers are on spikes, sticking way up. That's how the plant is advertising itself. And right in front of you, these purple flowers, they're advertising. Mm -hmm. You look way over at the mustard, same thing. Leaves towards the out. Come here, come here, come here. So, mm -hmm. I mean, everything that you see here is communication. It's either stay away from my leaves or it's come here, these are flowers. And so it just, I think it just really, you don't need to know species names to appreciate this interaction mm -hmm. between insects and, and don't want to forget hummingbirds and bats, of course, at night. Mm -hmm. They're using chemicals. Chem by the way, colors are chemicals. So carotenoids, you know, all these beautiful pigments, they're expensive. They, they, they give the birds the color. And the flowers, they're the flowers. expensive. I mean, the plant really is investing in a lot of material uh, and chemicals to, that they get a tremendous advantage, right? They get this dedicated, pollinator that has wings which yeah. the plant doesn't have they take advantage of the flight power of an insect and the ability of insects to learn and to be dedicated uh, yeah. in order to serve their own energy so that's that's all we wanted to say okay well so this seems know. like a great this seems like a great spot to sign out so if you and edward want to uh have that bush in the middle of you guys yeah, perfect. He's got his mask on. Oh, oh yeah. That's well, awesome. let me take my mask over here. Well, yeah. well, everybody, I thank you for joining us for another uh, virtual photo walk here. This was uh, really educational and fun, and you know we'll be doing this again soon. Uh, did you guys want to sign out with anything or say anything? Oh, you know, I might, I might show me the uh, Lisa's picture. We have a really good friend who who organized. Um, yeah, I have a picture from her website. It's one of the things that I mentioned. I don't know if you could see that. Nice. 
she has this savebees.org. Um, savebees.org. You see, isn't that fantastic? Get closer. And closer. Because and she, she really promotes the idea that, you know, there are native bees. There are many, many, many species. And as and a lot of people know, even my students, they come in, they know that bees are, are having a hard time. So that's one thing we wanted to mention is that she's taught us a lot about um, what's going on with native bees. And, you know, we, as I said, we need to, we want to thank the insects for this diversity. And it's not just the honeybee, but the native bees, which what Eulostack is trying to do is promote native flowers. And hopefully, oh, I could mention if you put a yellow pan trap out, if you put a yellow pan with water in it, the number of bees that come in, yellow, they love yellow, boom you get a huge variety of bees that you do not see when you just walk around here. Cool. There are thousands of native bees, and I think Eulostack hopefully is making a dent on mm -hmm. what's happening to them. I think okay. so. Well, thank you. <laughs> Send me oh. all the links and I'll put them in the show notes. Okay, sounds good, will do. Thank you everybody. Hit up the SaveByNature.org website and uh, Open Space Story website for more uh, virtual photo walks, including more painting with uh, Edward Brooks, and we'll be seeing Janice uh, shortly again soon, okay? Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a beautiful day. Perfect. Thank you.